So who is getting cardiac rehab? Who, what are the indications for cardiac rehab? Uh, medically stable post myocardial infarction, um, stable angina, coronary artery bypass graft, you're, you see a lot of those, um, percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, um, compensated uh, congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathy, heart or lung transplant. Um, a lot of times in uh, an inpatient setting, you're um, seeing the uh, people with heart or lung transplant or other lung um, surgeries. So different, different lung surgeries that they do. And then you really appreciate a, a cardiac walker because there's tons of places to hang chest tubes and put oxygen bottles and <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, valve surgery, um, pacemaker or um, defibrillator implantation. Um, the automatic implantable cardioverter defibrillator, that's the AICD and um, pacemaker, uh, pacemaker, they are putting in for people that have um, bradycardia or sinus node block or AV conduction block. Um, mechanical circulatory support device, um, which is another um, sort of uh, portable defibrillator thing. Um, high risk uh, cor uh, coronary artery disease where they haven't been able to do surgery for whatever reason. Um, sudden cardiac death syndrome, gee, that sounds fun, right? Um, that's where your heart just gives out. And um, hopefully if it gives out in a situation where someone can immediately um, start CPR and um, activate the EMS system, then you recover from that. Um, and a lot of times it's younger people that that happens to, so they're not expecting it. Um, if, if someone's at risk for um, coronary artery disease, especially with diabetes, dyslipidemia, and hypertension, um, they can be in usually outpatient cardio, uh, cardiac rehab. Um, there's no focus on primary prevention of those diseases. So if you recall from um, patho, uh, the primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So um, cardiac rehab is basically tertiary prevention where you're um, helping people that already have the disease improve their lives. So if you want to think of it that way. So a lot of times um, we are seeing these people when they're in the hospital. And in fact, the phases of cardiac rehab, phase one is inpatient during acute inpatient hospitalization. So um, phase one of cardiac rehab is entirely conducted by physical therapy or for the most part. Um, it can also bridge over into subacute um, because people are, um, they're not keeping people in the hospital as long. And if people are unable to go home, um, they might be continuing their cardiac rehab in subacute. So I have um, worked with some cardiac rehab patients in inpatient and in subacute. Um, phase two is outpatient. Um, and this is your specialized supervised ambulatory outpatient cardiac rehab, which usually lasts from three to six months. Um, most of the time it's in a hospital, um, it's hospital based outpatient setting. Um, Skagit Valley Hospital has a cardiac rehab um, department and um, Platte Valley or Platte Valley Medical Center is the hospital they worked at 40 years ago. <laughs> But it's Peace Health, not Platte Valley Medical Center, um, which is in Colorado. Um, Peace Health, St. Joseph's um, here in Bellingham has um, cardiac rehab as well for phase two and phase three. Phase three is considered the maintenance phase, which focuses on um, physical fitness and risk factor reduction. There's a lot of education involved with it. Um, it's either in a minimally supervised or unsupervised setting. So people in phase two cardiac rehab, um, it's, sur it's supervised exercise. They're actually on a monitor and they have um, exercise physiologists monitoring their telemetry while they're exercising and educating them about it as well. And we'll talk about what... Um, what happens in each of these phases, what activities we're doing. But what we're gonna be doing as PTAs is phase one.
just so you know that. So activity classifications are usually um, when you're in the hospital. Um, so activity classification one is patient, the patient's either in ICU or the cardiac care floor. Um, they can sit up in bed with assistance. Um, they can do their own self-care seated. So, you know, brushing their teeth, washing their face, et cetera. Um, putting on, putting in their hearing aids, whatever, whatever needs to be done. Um, they can stand at the bedside with assist and they can sit up into the chair, in their chair, 15 to 30 minutes, two to three times per day. So you wouldn't believe how much of a workout sitting up in a chair for 15 to 30 minutes can be when you're in this stage of cardiac rehab. So um, as PTAs, of course, we're not doing the initial evaluation. So if someone has had, let's say they had a coronary artery bypass graft or a valve replacement um, and they're in the ICU, we'll probably be seeing them in the afternoon of the second day after their surgery in the ICU. And at that point, they're getting ready to move to the cardiac care floor. So um, this is kind of one of my favorite phases because the patient is now thinking like, this is great, I'm starting to feel better. Um, I'm getting out of ICU and you're helping them sit up in the bed with assist. You're helping them stand at the bedside. You're helping them get up to the chair um, two to three times per day. So um, that's kind of a, I like that phase. <laughs> classification two, activity classification. Um, they're on telemetry at all times. They're, the telemetry is monitored, monitored by nursing staff. This is usually on the cardiac care floor. Um, they can sit up in bed independently. They can stand independently and they can walk in their room and in the bathroom. Um, and so a lot of times um, when we're working with these people, we're working on bed mobility, working on bed exercises. We'll look at what um, a therapy session is gonna look like for these people. This is a good time though, because people are happy right now. They, um, they're starting to be more independent. They know they're gonna be going home soon. This is a happy patient to work with. However, they're still on telemetry. And so um, the good thing is if anything goes wrong, everybody knows it right away. Okay, classification three, sits and stands independently, does their own self-care and sitting, seated or standing, walks in the halls with assistance, 50 to 100 feet up to three times a day. So um, a lot of times what we're doing in um, therapy when we're working with these people, we're helping them um, extend the amount that they're walking, we're helping them um, monitor their activity level during their self-care and seated or standing. Um, classification four does their own self-care and bathing. You would be surprised how tiring taking a shower is after you've had heart surgery. Um, walking in the halls short distances, 150 to 200 feet with min assist three to four times a day. A lot of times these people are still on oxygen. They're still on an IV. Um, there, depending on what their surgery was, they might have a chest tube if they had lung surgery. Um, so you're probably walking with them with a cardiac walker. And we'll talk about why that is when we talk about sternal precautions. Um, and so you're um, working on increasing their activity tolerance. You're monitoring their um, reaction to exercise. Classification five and six, they are walking in the halls independently, moderate distances, 250 to 500 feet, three to four times a day. So a lot of times they're doing that outside of their therapy sessions. Um, and you might be working on a little bit more um, exercise related or mobility related things during your session. Um, classification six, independent ambulation on the unit um, three to six times per day. So they're, um, they're walking on their own. Nice. That's a, it's a good place to be. So in phase one, um, we are going to gradually progress their activities um, from passive range of motion of upper and lower extremities to active range of motion of upper and lower extremities, um, one to two METs, which is metabolic equivalence. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Um, bed mobility, super important. Transfer to standing, transferring to a chair. Um, the bedside commode takes less energy than a bedpan. And 
I believe that. So it's it's to their benefit to be able to to for us to work on bed mobility and transfers um, to get them up and going. It's definitely easier for them to get up to a bedside commode. We want to avoid isometrics because isometrics can increase your heart rate. We don't want to do that. Um, we want to avoid anything that um, causes them to use a Valsalva maneuver where you hold your breath against a, a closed glottis because that promotes arrhythmias. It also increases your thoracic pressure and can spike your blood pressure. Never a good thing. Um, we want to avoid raising their lower extremities above their heart because that can increase the heart's preload. Remember, because it increases venous return. So um, when we're doing bed exercises, we have to think about that. What position are they in um, so we can do things without raising their lower extremities above their heart? So in phase one, we are educating them on sternal precautions, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, posture correction, so upright posture means better breathing. Um, rate of perceived exertion assessment, and we'll talk a lot more about that. So um, a lot of times when someone has heart disease or is on certain medications, um, you, it's difficult to assess the amount that they're working by their heart rate because either their heart rate is being controlled by a pacemaker or it's being controlled by medications. So we have to go with the rate of perceived exertion and we'll talk about how to assess that in the next section. We're looking at their gait pattern. Um, we're recommending and um, instructing them in using assistive devices, and we are instructing them in pacing and energy conservation. So this is all super important stuff. There's no universal definition of sternal precautions. Um, usually the a facility that you work in will um, have a set of sternal precautions, but generally it includes no, no lifting more than five to 10 pounds, no reaching behind the back so you can't push yourself up off a chair, no pushing or pulling through your arms so you can't pull yourself up on a handrail. Um, additional instructions might prohibit reaching overhead with one or both arms um, or driving. And it can be recommended by the surgeon that they adhere these for anywhere between four to 12 weeks. So the reason they have sternal precautions is because um, if they have to cut open their sternum, they wire it closed and that has to heal. So you can imagine if you reach back to push with both arms, you're putting a lot of pressure right there on the sternum. Um, this picture is of a heart pillow. A lot of hospitals will give people a heart pillow um, when they have heart surgery, they hold it, cross their arms over the pillow and hold it against them while they're standing, doing sit to stands or transfers um, to avoid using their arms. You can also hold it against you if you need to cough or, some, or sneeze or something to stabilize your trunk. Um, so you'll see those heart pillows sometimes. The, um, you know, I haven't been in the hospital um, during the since the beginning of the pandemic, so I don't know what's changed with these, <laughs> if anything. But um, anyway, that's your sternal precautions. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, rate of perceived exertion and metabolic equivalents um, when we're talking about exercise. So you can see that the um, exercise that we're doing in phase one, which is mostly what we're doing, is pretty basic, but super important for getting these people home. And that's what most people, I really liked working on the cardiac floor when I worked in the hospital because most people were headed home and they were excited about it. So um, I'll, in class, I'll tell you some stories about <laughs> people that I worked with on the cardiac floor. It's always fun. <laughs> 